Welcome everyone to our program, Transforming K-12 in the Time of COVID-19. This is another in our series of CCC virtual town halls. It's our back to school edition. And today the world passed a somber milestone, one million dead worldwide from a coronavirus pandemic that only emerged 10 months ago. 200,000 have succumbed in the United States alone. And the global tally of COVID-19 fatalities is greater than for HIV, malaria, influenza, and cholera. When the pandemic struck this spring, schools around the world were closed and instruction went virtual for millions of students. The spotlight fell immediately on educational technology to address the gaps. However, teachers, parents, and even kids soon realized that they needed not only access to online content, but to traditional print content as well. The disruptions caused by COVID-19 will have long lasting repercussions throughout the coming school year and beyond. The ambitious goal of teachers, administrators, and parents is to curb the spread of the coronavirus while enhancing student outcomes and improving accessibility. Meanwhile, learning continues with schools delivering a mix of in-person, remote, and hybrid teaching. Communities everywhere need flexible, creative solutions from publishers and technology providers that allow students, families, and teachers to adapt to changing requirements with minimal interruption to the learning experience. In today's special forum, we will hear from publishing leaders and learning solutions providers who will share their lesson plans for digital transformation in this new reality. Public school classrooms, it turns out, may be great equalizers as much as they are great for education. In a world gone dramatically digital as well, print books and workbooks can close the learning gap that digital often opens up. In April, HP Inc. launched a print-on-demand publishing program through the HP Piazza platform that has delivered blended learning resources to underserved students across the United States during the pandemic. By converting digital content to printed booklets, grade school children now have equal access to materials focused on STEM and environmental topics. Paul Randall leads the product marketing team within the HP Publishing Solutions organization. HP brings to market solutions that reduce production complexity and automate scalable distributed print. And HP Piazza is the first such solution brought to market. Paul Randall joins me now from London in the United Kingdom. Welcome, Paul. Christopher, thank you. And um, good afternoon, morning, evening to, to everyone who's joining us, depending on obviously where you're, where you're based. So um, quite some somber statistics there. I, I hadn't heard those until um, Christopher um, shared that information with us. So, you know, it's, it's been quite some months. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, reflecting on the fact that today's session is called the, you know, the, the, the back to school. And um, I, for one, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, um, you know, we've got ourselves into a position finally where we have got school children returning back to the, to the classrooms. It's been a very, very challenging um, few months. Um, and, you know, I think there's been a lot of lessons that have come out of that. And we're going to share some of that today. J just um, in, in kind of quickly introducing HP, I know that Christopher's introduced me from a, from a personal perspective and, and, and led into the conversation about HP. Let, let me just take a minute or two just to introduce and, and reinforce why HP, I think, are involved in this, um, this conversation and this very important topic that we're here to, to share today. So HP have been a an industry leader in, in, in print technology for um, the last 30 years and have provided print technology into the publishing industry um, for, for many of those years. Uh, our, our belief estimation is that um, uh, around half of the print on demand books that are produced in the market today are done using HP technology. So it's an industry that we're, we're entrenched within. It's, it's an industry that we're providing um, technology and hardware to. But if we step back from that a little bit, and, and look at the HP um, kind of company philosophy. Our, our, our organization is one that's based around, um, you know, entrepreneurialism at, at its core. And, and our company mission is to continue to look at how we can reinvent and, and use technology to improve lives for, for everybody um, everywhere. And, and I think that really is the kind of the segue into um, today's discussion. Whilst we've had print technology in the market now for a number of years, um, really you know, the focus for HP today for this conversation is, is really about how we can look at 
the, 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 the process of reinvention for an industry and and and, and move things on to a, to a better place and and that's what kind of brings us um, to the to the topic of HP Piazza which as Christopher said um, at its core Piazza is a is a cloud-based digital asset management system and, and the most simplistic way I can um, describe this is that with Piazza what we're doing is we're bridging the world of publishing with the world of digital print so at its core it's a digital asset management system um, where a publisher can hold their inventory in a, in a in a virtual environment to remove the need for holding stock and and, and having warehousing and and look at obsolescence and book miles and environmental sustainability and all of those things um, but leveraging really the ability to print on demand so what we have with the, the Piazza solution is the ability to connect that to a global print on demand network. So, so connecting into um, the, the, the print service providers in the industry that have um, invested into HP um, print technology. Um, and then really, if we, if we move on then to take that to the next stage of, of the story, what, what I wanted to do is to share how that technology has made a real benefit or bought real benefit I should say to um, to the educational sector today so I want to share um, the Piazza Cafe initiative it's linked to the HP turn to learn um, um, initiative and really this is the example of how we're bridging the world of publishing with with digital book print production um, so, so this initiative that we we launched um, uh, around the uh, the second quarter of the fiscal year um, was really done on the basis of the COVID-19 pandemic and really addressing the issue that, that came to the fore very quickly about that um, access gap that existed um, with students having to learn from home, not potentially being able to access key learning materials. So this was a project that was undertaken in collaboration with some key leading um, content um, providers. So, so partnering with Time for Kids, uh, Britannica and, and NASA, um, th this process and this project was looking at how we could ingest the content from those content owners into the HP Piazza platform, um, but actually have it then connect connected to a global print on demand network so that we could be providing physically printed educational packets to those students that were home learning that didn't necessarily have access to the digital meeting learning learning devices that that they um, needed in in the situation that they found themselves in so, so converting digital content across the stm um, subjects all of that was able to then be printed on demand in the form of physical booklets and delivered directly to, to students for that, for that home learning environment. And, you know, again, then just, just moving on to look at that and, you know, the lessons, I guess, that are, that are learned from the, from the pandemic that we've, that we've seen across um, recent months. Um, a, a colleague used a phrase on, on a, on, a, on a, yet another Zoom call that I was on yesterday, which um, really um, hit home with me. And, and, and the phrase that, the, that this colleague used was that the curtain has been pulled back on the idea of digital only. Um, and and I, I, in saying that, I'm, I'm by no means um, looking at, you know, the digital first and the digital led um, development as, as a negative. But I think, you know, what, what has really happened in terms of pulling that curtain back is we've seen an acceleration of learning in a very short space of time in the last few months where that hypothesis of digital first and, and potentially digital only has really been tested to the to the nth degree. And, you know, there are some things that have come out of that, which, you know, we now need to reflect on and, and, and need to understand in terms of, you know, how we can best support the educational space with, with, with learning materials. So, you know, there were three key things I think that you know the curtain was, was, was pulled back on in, in terms of lessons to be learned. What one inevitably, as we've said, is that ability to access content. Um, so some various statistics here, lot, lots of surveys around the you know the so-called digital divide. Um, a, a first book survey recently, I think it estimated 80% um, of 86% edu of educators were concerned that children ha don't have books at home. Um, Statistics say that forty percent of students in the U.S. have no reliable internet access, um, and thirty-seven percent don't actually have access to a functioning um, digital device. So, so there, there is a divide. There, there are limits. 
Um, and, you know, we need to, to be able to address that. And, and you know, more recently in the US, um, divine intervention, you know, the hand of God, there, there's been, you know, various um, challenges that people have faced with hurricanes and, 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 and acts of nature, which have only further kind of exacerbated those, those issues. So, you know, we have to ensure that we're giving access in an equal way to, to, to students. Um, there, there's the format kind of question or, or, or conversation. Um, again, various research statistic about um, you know, how retention for students is supported better in, in physical form. Um, and you know the, the the interaction with digital devices is um, is a less uh, immersive process. And if you just look at the you know the scrolling nature of interaction with digital devices, that there is um, it is believed you know a, a limit to people's ability to absorb and retain that information. And obviously, there's development at the at the younger age set, certainly around you know the development of fine fine motor skills. And, and then equally as well, it's you know, it's important to understand the, the voice of the students, um, that there are, you know, groups that we need to cater for in, in, in many different ways. Um, there are preferences in, in, in formats that students are expressing. And I think in the US, there's still 50% of students that are expressing a preference for physical format. Um, it's beyond the US as well, though. Uh, I was on a, another webinar last week um, where a publisher in South Africa um, told us that for every 1,000 um, physical books they sell, they only sell 10 ebooks. So, you know, there, there is still a huge demand for physical content. The, on, on the same webinar, uh, a leading publisher from Mexico actually reinforced that it's the younger age groups that are striving to access materials in a, in a, in a physical form. So, you know, there, there are many um, kind of uh, reasons that are playing out to really look at how we balance this um, blended environment and, and the digital with, with the physical. So, Christopher, th th those are the, the key insights that I wanted to share today. Well, it's, it's a great place to start, Paul, and we're going to hear more about this challenge to provide digital solutions, but also physical copies, physical materials. Well, as I say here, a good deal more about that. But before we move on to our next guest, Paul, just as a way of follow-up, you mentioned that you have heard this reinforced from um, people you've spoken with in Mexico and South Africa. I wouldn't be surprised if it's true in the UK as well. But the Piazza uh, Learn to uh, Turn to Learn initiative in the US was, it, it made dramatic differences. I believe hundreds of thousands of materials have been distributed, and particularly in Miami-Dade County, Florida, where, where um, that digital divide is is strikingly apparent. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, recent numbers say that we've um, distributed 290,000 um, educational packets, if you like, to um, underserved students across the US. And, and actually that first initiative, whilst predominantly was US, it also um, covered Canada and um, Haiti as well. So, so it wasn't exclusively the US. Um, you know, what we're seeing now, I guess, is the is the um, you know the second um, I'm trying not to use the phrase second wave. What we're trying to see now is that the second phase of of that initiative um, playing out again as we're, we're into this back to school environment. And, and really, what we're looking at now is how we can further support increased um, geographies with that with that process. All right. Well, Paul Randall with HP in London, thank you so much for that presentation. And among the publishing partners for the HP Piazza Cafe Turn to Learn initiative is Britannica Group. Publishers of Britannica, Merriam-Webster, Britannica Knowledge Systems, and Malingo. Karthnik, Karthik Krishnan is the global CEO of Britannica Group, where he is focused on elevating trustable information in the digital universe and transforming learning both inside and outside the classroom. Karthik Krishnan is also an adjunct professor at New York University Stern School of Business, where he teaches students about the media industry and how disruptive forces are reshaping our industry. He was recognized by former President Clinton for his leadership in launching the Urban Enterprise Initiative. Karthik Krishnan joins me from New York. Welcome to the program, Karthik. Thank you, Chris. Well, we look forward to learning more about Britannica Group's decision to join this Turn to Learn initiative, Karthik. And I suppose it comes down to that old rule of leadership, never let a good crisis go to waste. That is spot on. Amy, could I get control of my slides? Thank you. On a second.
Looks like we have some technical challenges. I mean, this is part of our resilience. We'll, we'll see this through as well. Well, well, well we, or Haley, why don't you go ahead and like tee it up? I mean, I can just talk to it. Well, well first, I'm just going to remind our uh, audience that if they do have a question for any of the panelists, we will be happy to address as many of those as we can at the end of the program. Uh, use the chat function uh, in the uh, uh, in your screen. Uh, display and let us know what's on your mind if the question is particularly for uh, one of the panelists just address that to to him or her and we'll make sure that uh, we get as many of those in as we can and I think now we're all set Karthik so uh, we mentioned about crises we had a small one of our own but we're back online I think and uh, there we go so Karthik over to you great thank you while the disruptive 21st century got even more disruptive on the heels of COVID, it's also an opportunity for us to pause and ask ourselves, who do we choose to be? Structural disruptions, including the current COVID crisis, provides an opportunity for us to break with the past and reimagine and architect a new and better world. I think that's where the opportunity is. We are seeing a paradigm shift in how we approach education. COVID has quickly changed some of our deeply seated beliefs and behaviors. As you can clearly see here, we initially pre-COVID believed that schools and colleges were the only place where learning can happen. Post-COVID, all of a sudden, you know, we feel that learning can happen anywhere, and there are two different models out there as well, both synchronous and asynchronous. Historically, the teacher has been the sage on the stage, providing all the information that's needed. But with post-COVID, we realized that there are super teachers who are amazing at teaching, who can reach the far corners of the world, and it's possible for us to tap into their wisdom and their ability to teach. So which means other teachers can actually play a facilitating role to enhance and inspire student learning. When it comes to access to learning centers, 650 million students across the world do not have access to a school system. So with remote learning, that provides an opportunity for us to reach the far corners of the world. Uh, particularly with digital delivery, and there is also an opportunity to leapfrog using mobile. Finally, the world has always uh, pegged on standardized test scores. Now, with top schools not requiring SAT, SAT scores, and also the focus much more on competency, I think the world is shifting in a big way. Moving on, you know, I think, what does this mean for us as publishers? I think the key thing is, how do we move from the focus on education to learning? There is a key distinction between education and learning. Education is extrinsic and it's passive. Learning, on the other hand, is intrinsic and driven by curiosity. So our goal is to actually move the paradigm to go from education to learning. As you make that shift from one paradigm to another, what we found, find is that learning focuses on discovery of knowledge. It's all about community-based learning. It's about construction and creation, and the focus ultimately is not on grades and certification, but it's on skills and experiences. So as we as publishers start approaching this whole paradigm, we just need to figure out how do we make our content more discover discoverable? How do we build communities around content where learning can happen? How do we personalize learning, right? Those are the biggest opportunities facing publishers like us. The other piece is I know a lot of us have traditional physical books as well. Here's an opportunity for us to connect the physical and the digital world to tap into a bigger pool of resources and create a learning community. Imagine a textbook leading into a QR code where you can actually see a video tutorial on how things are done. Libraries can actually start collecting and sharing more books by using QR codes that connect to eBooks. And finally, imagine if you can link the content that's being created with user-generated content from students and teachers that provides a great, great opportunity for building a thriving learning community. Finally, as you think about these things as well, how do we move from content orientation to how do we help students understand, experience, and apply? The key is, once you use a textbook to understand how centripetal force work, what if you're able to use a VR-based virtual reality experience to really figure out how that centripetal force works? And ultimately, there is also an opportunity for us to apply some of this learning by having them go home, fill a small bucket with water, put a string, and spin it around your head, right? So now the student is not just like consuming information passively. They go from understanding a concept to experiencing a concept to applying that concept. 
And then finally, as we start building solutions today in a remote world where learning can happen asynchronously or synchronously, it's important for us to stoke the intrinsic motivation. How do we ensure that you know, kids are very comfortable picking things up on their own and learning, much like the way they do with video games? So again, we have applied things like uh, Desi and Ryan's theory on self-determination theory. And these are built into our tools like Puku, which is a vocabulary building tool that we created. So basically this creates self-motivation for the child to sit down and play these word-based games to really enhance their vocabulary and go from read to learn to, re to learn to read mode. Finally, as we talk about all these things, we cannot forget the digital divide. The digital and remote learning is not a universal silver bullet at this point. So we as publishers need to start thinking about how do we ensure that we break the digital divide and ensure better learning outcomes irrespective of where you are. Ultimately, this, the saying is, talent is distributed evenly, but opportunities are not. So from our perspective, we need to focus on three things. In addition to print, how do you build low bandwidth and offline capabilities? Can you also have digital print capabilities, much like the one Paul highlighted that uh, HP is working on? So in our case, you know, we partnered with uh, the HP team to create a print-on-demand solution. So when we realized that a number of students, particularly in inner school districts, were struggling in terms of having access to good learning material, Britannica decided to dig into its deep, deep digital print routes to really create a package that can be printed on demand and delivered to students. So think about this as mass personalization of learning based on what you needed to do and being able to pair that up with the print on demand technology from HP really helped us. Finally, we as publishers need to find, start thinking beyond content, which is the supply or the input side to really focusing on how do we shape meaningful learning experiences that cut across multiple channels, whether it's print or digital. And when it comes to digital, there is a plethora of channels we need to focus on from search to voice to video to social and internet of things. Finally, as I bring this together, in a world that is changing so rapidly where learners decide when, where, and how to consume information, we as publishers need to be both medium and device agnostic because it could be mobile today, it could be IoT tomorrow, or it could be a membrane that's tied to your skin through which people will be consuming information. So our goal is to build as many engaging channels with the target audience and enhance learning outcomes. Thank you, Chris. Well, well thank you indeed, Karthik uh, Krishnan, the CEO of Britannica Group. And you mentioned at the end there, Karthik, the, the real need to be present as a publisher in as many channels as possible. And, I guess that raises a question for a lot of people in our audience, which is, is my content ready to do that? And so I wonder, were you ready to go when you were presented with the chance to leverage the Piazza platform? And really it comes down to, was your metadata house in order? We did. Uh, we've been working on the digital transformation for a long time. In fact, Britannica started talking about digital publishing as early as the 1970s uh, with people like Marvin Minsky. Uh, in fact, when the XML standards were written in the late 90s, uh, people like Tim Bray came to Britannica to understand how do we organize content. So I think we were able to have those things, but at the same time, this is a journey that everybody needs to go on. How do we micro tag our content? Because today, people start out with micro information and then move up. So in this kind of a world, things like knowledge graph, semantic references become absolutely critical in terms of how we can actually activate multiple learning journeys for people. Well, thank you for that, Karthik Krishnan, CEO of Britannica Group. We'll come back to you and to Paul Randall at the end of our program with a roundtable discussion. If you have a question or a comment for our panel, please use the chat box to let us know what's on your mind. And earlier this month, in coordination with participating publishers, CCC and EL Education announced a partnership to provide U.S. schools and districts that have adopted the EL Education Language Arts curriculum with the ability to easily obtain permission to use grade level texts for distance learning. Beth Miller is the Chief Knowledge Officer at EL Education, a leading K-12 nonprofit that is redefining student achievement in diverse communities across the United States. EL Education's core work is building teacher capacity in schools and districts through world-class coaching, resources, and open source curriculum. Beth Miller 
joins me from Boston. Welcome to the program, Beth. Thanks. Great to be here. And I'm happy to sort of tell one story that I think will ground a lot of the comments that Paul made uh, around things like equity and that Karthik made around the, uh, the learning sciences in our experience, because um, one thing that we do is where we are a curriculum publisher, and I'll tell sort of the story of our curriculum for a few minutes, but we also partner directly with hundreds of schools and a dozen districts around the country where we provide coaching and professional development. So we're kind of seeing this on the ground, um, a, lot, a lot of what we've heard. When we went to build our curriculum about 10 years ago, we built it around text. We'd been in business as an education provider for 20 years at that point, and we have a whole school model and I'm sorry for that beeping in the background. Um, a truck decided to back up outside my window, remote, remote experience, hopefully it ends soon. Uh, but we knew that the right way to build a curriculum for us and for the way we see education is through books, through what we call worthy texts, that we weren't going to have um, bits and pieces of excerpts from different pieces, but we were gonna have every unit focused on a text that would really engage students in some of the ways that Karthik was talking about, build their understanding of themselves, of the larger world, give them a sense of agency and purpose in that world, um, and create what's been called windows and mirrors. So mirrors of their own culture and identity that would help them grow as learners, and also mirrors that would build their multiple perspectives. Um, you can go to the next slide. We, we built it originally in response to New York State. And New York State, like many, many, pretty much every other state about 10 years ago had these wonderful new higher standards. You know, we're gonna have kids really achieve a lot more, um, but whoops, they didn't necessarily have a curriculum that was aligned to those standards. So New York State uh, created a whole for every, subject that was going to be tested set of curricula and we worked on the English language arts curriculum um, and built that as I said around those worthy texts so you can see that in whether it's in um, you know the low grades or the higher grades the the text is absolutely key to the work the two other things that are sort of important to know is one this is an open education resource so when we built it for new york they put it on up on a website called new york engage still there also on our website also a number of other places been downloaded well, well over 10 million times uh, and it creates a headset around everything being available and you'll see that that came back to bite us a little bit in the last few months um, but that's one important aspect. And the other one is that we have always been an organization that focused as much on academic achievement and core subjects as on what we call character or social and emotional learning. So integrated into this curriculum is social and emotional learning. It's not a separate program that's like eight to 9 a.m. on Tuesday. It's built through the texts and the activities and the kinds of final projects also that Karthik was talking about where students get to really experience the learning. Next is uh, what happened. So we all know what happened. You know, we're all moving along. We work with uh, districts all around the country. I'll talk a little bit about Detroit, but we work with a bunch of districts in North Carolina, with Oakland, with rural districts in Hamilton County, Tennessee, with districts in Florida and so on. Um, as well as 150 schools that we work with very intensively and have for many years. So we're working in all these places, things are moving along, coronavirus. I don't need to tell anybody on this call uh, that we had a health situation. And that of course had many ripple effects. So in terms of education, what do we know? We know that uh, we always see huge equity gaps around summer learning loss. And in addition to that, now we have the coronavirus slide. The best information we have from RAND Corporation is that students 
learned about 65% of what they normally would in a year last year. But that is an average and low income students uh, are going to have even larger losses than that. And you add to that the summer slide. So we've got um, big education challenges. Again, not a surprise to anybody here. We also had the economic effects. So many of the students that we serve are in communities where parents are essential workers and or parents are among those 30 plus million unemployed. So in addition to the health impact and what that does to a young person's mental and physical well-being, we also have the economic impact. And finally, racism. And that has been something we've been grappling with in two ways in this pandemic. One is the way that it's uh, inequitably affected communities and many of our students, but also the, the racial reckoning that we're really coming to grips with as a country. Um, what does that mean for students? So I think one thing it means is that we really need to be doing both those things of academic learning and supporting students' social and emotional wellness like never before. But you can go to the next slide. Uh, we have a challenge, right? And, and uh, the previous speakers reference this as well because we don't have equitable access once students are sent home and what you see and this is a, a national estimate of the fact that students who are in those higher free reduced lunch so higher poverty groups at the bottom are much more less likely to have access to a device uh, working closely with detroit we found that about 10 percent of the students in the district had access to both internet and a device. Uh, a, a large group of them had access to a parent's phone, but obviously that's a hard thing to learn on all day. They're not the only kids using that phone. The parent might need to go to work uh, with their phone. Some students had access to a device, but not Wi-Fi and so on. So we had major equity problems with access to education and a real need um, besides the fact that our curriculums built around text and classroom sets of books, um, we just can't just shift over to a internet digital learning platform. Um, you can go to the next slide. What do we find? People thought we had the answers. We got dozens, hundreds of emails like this, like, please send us the EL version. Um, our books are all at school. We can't go into school. Or even in the cases where they were able to access their school, they didn't have books for every student. They had classroom sets or they had a teacher book or so on. So, you know, that just wasn't going to work. Um, you can go to the next slide. And um, again, this is just another example of what we heard, you know, oh, could you please send us the virtual version, <laughs> which we already know isn't going to meet all students' needs, but um, which they were looking to us to. Um, so this was a big challenge. We built a curriculum, high quality curriculum around text, and now we couldn't access the text. You can go to the last slide. Uh, so we have done two things. One, most directly for this conversation, we've partnered with CCC to work with publishers to make print and PDF versions of those texts available so that folks could access them for students who are at home. They could print packets and deliver them, which they did all over Detroit, 30,000 kids, uh, so that other students could access the content of those texts. But we also actually had to make a lot of other shifts in the curriculum. You can see we really shifted it to, we know that this year is going to be super challenging, right? We're not going to say students are at home, students are in school, we've got hybrid, we will have shifting conditions as coronavirus comes to various locations. So we know that we need to be flexible and partnerships have been key to that because we are going to have to keep learning together and you can just go at the end there we've included how to connect because we're all learning we're all learning in the moment now and we need to be learning together so we look to all of you my co-panelists and those of you in the audience to continue this learning together thank you well, well, well thank you uh beth miller chief knowledge officer with Yale education and you know your point that we're all learning it, it it can't be said enough and we've heard uh COVID-19 referred to as kind of 
throwing us all into a sort of experimental uh, ecosystem where everything's an experiment. And yet um, in experiments, traditional experiments, there are control groups, there's, there's, there's hypotheses that get tested. And, and unfortunately, when it comes to the educational experience with so many children, Beth, what you're saying is a lot of it has just been thrown in the air and, and some kids are not landing, uh, well, they may be landing on their heads. Yes. Um, as a researcher, I have a PhD, actually, I, I cannot call this an experiment. Um, but I do think that, you know, there are there is a lot of opportunity here. We are learning a tremendous amount. There's a tremendous amount of innovation. And as long as we don't lose sight of those important issues of equity and of learning from what we know now about how students learn in the learning sciences, um, we could come out the better for it. Well, th well, again, thank you, Beth Miller with Yale Education. And our, our final guest uh, is a colleague of mine at Copyright Clearance Center. Andrew Campana is Business Development Director at CCC. Prior to joining CCC, Andrew worked at PBS and WGBH, one of the U.S.'s leading public broadcasters. And it may be worth pointing out in this program that public TV was once known as educational television. And I know that some people may think that's an oxymoron, but while at PBS uh, and, and now with CCC, Andrew, you've worked extensively on developing creative licensing solutions that support educational markets. Uh, what are you seeing emerge as the lasting impacts of COVID-19? Well, thank you, Chris, appreciate that. I'm not sure I can speak to the lasting impacts. That, that time will tell. Um, but I do would say that, you know, that one of the most interesting things about this entire experience is that from our perspective at CCC, the trends that we're seeing like really hitting the market today really are just amplifications of trends that we'd already observed uh, in the educational space, things such as the adoption of digital tools, the desire for personalization and adaptability around, uh, you, you know, leveraging the power of those digital tools and also the move to more open uh, uh, curriculum, uh, that could be reused and remixed, such as Beth was speaking about the EL curriculum being an open curriculum. Um, and that there's definitely some challenge around this. We've heard this from all three panelists that this type of movement created some huge dependencies in the market, as that's the term that we've been using around both the physical technology, such as what equipment is the student using? How is it going to be supported by the school systems? How does the student know how to use it? bandwidth dependencies, you know, do the students have adequate bandwidth to access the materials that, that the digital tools are providing? And a third one that, that just actually has come up, which is many people are surprisingly not as familiar with the language of technology that, than you would, you would expect, uh, you know, simple things like click here, find this link, what does this icon mean that many of us who are fluent in internet understand instinctively uh, are, are difficult for people who have not had a vast amount of exposure to that type of experience. So, you know, this is something that parents will face with their children when receiving instructions. And of course, this leads to, to, to an increase in inequality uh, among, you know, among students for those that lack those dependencies. Um, you know, this is where print is a marvelous technology, and this is something I also emphasize, that print is a technology. Uh, it was a fabulous technology invented in the 14th century. It's highly flexible. It's highly uh, usable by every student. Uh, it has its own dependencies. It has to be physical. It has to be moved and delivered in that way, but, but nonetheless, it is. Um, and I think, you know, and obviously, for those of those people who are developing educational products uh, to deliver in these various new platforms and ways, there are licensing issues that immediately arise that we've been trying to, to address over the last couple of years. But I think fundamentally, and this may speak to your long-term, what is the long-term uh, impact of COVID-19 and the acceleration and amplification of these changes, is that content must be available to students where they are and not where we want them to be. You know, and this is something that's really critical that, that you need to create the flexibility in your systems and in your delivery to be able to address that particular issue because we're not 100% sure where the students are going to be uh, at any given point. And, you know, that may be highly beneficial, but it does create these challenges. 
So, you know, fundamentally, uh, you know, this highlights the need for flexible licensing, technolo technological infrastructure, and CCC is striving to provide uh, flexible, uh, innovative licensing solutions, technology, and also promote active communication, as Beth was saying, among the stakeholders so that people can, can explain the, the challenge that they're facing and how we might find solutions. Okay, next slide, please. So, you know, we'll just go through some of the things that CC has been doing. I mean, in creating these flexible licensing solutions. Beth mentioned we worked with EL this summer and directly with, with many publishers to support the access to text for learners. Um, we hope that this has been helpful in getting students the text they need to use the EL curriculum appropriately. Um, the, you know, the jury is still out. We're about a month into the process and we'll see how that goes. Um, simultaneously with that, uh, over the last year, CCC has been piloting a collective license for curriculum materials. Um, you know, our, our thinking here is that as uh, curriculum publishers want to use material from various third parties, that it may be more efficient to have some sort of collective licensing solution that would allow the, the easy reuse and integration of material into these, uh, into these digital and print uh, curriculum or curricula, um, and so we're piloting that. But in the past, uh, we created a program similar to the HP program to enable the delivery of print materials to students for locally created uh, open educational curricula. Um, we worked with the state of Louisiana, which had a curriculum called um, guidebooks that involve both the open element, as Beth explained, the element that they created, as well as the fundamental texts, which were owned by a variety of publishers. And so we've created a print-on-demand solution there. Uh, I believe we've also been using that same solution in Detroit historically to support uh, the EL curriculum there with, uh, with one of our partners uh, locally in Michigan. So we've been, we've been helping that. And, you know, this all goes back to work we did back in 2014 uh, related to the assessments that went along with Common Core, um, that, that the, uh, the, did the US federal government supported the creation of some large consortia to build uh, new assessments against the new standards. And one of those consortia was building an adaptable testing framework that was gonna be delivered digitally and was facing a lot of the licensing challenges that go along with that. So we created a collective license to support uh, adaptive, the, you know, these adaptive engines so they could access much more content from a wider variety of publishers um, and deliver that content to students on assessment. So we've sort of learned from that experience and, and built that experience out now more into the curriculum space. Next slide, please. And, you know, interestingly enough, as we've addressed this, CCC has also been working on the technological side. Uh, again, this has come up uh, previously in the conversation that in order to create a dynamic learning environment to exploit these channels that you need to meet the students where they are and not where you want them to be, you know, you need to create metadata optimization. You need to know what your content is, what it says, and what it's appropriate for, where it's been used. Um, and so, uh, CCC has, uh, has professional services around metadata optimization and advanced content management to support that, and all of which will simplify workflows so that these things can happen quickly. Uh, COVID came on very quickly. Um, I think that we will see in the future that there'll be much more, di it'll be much more dynamic space education. Education has been very slow to change. There are a lot of reasons why that is. Um, you know, people fail to imagine in some ways the scope of public education in the United States. There are 55 million public school, or yeah, public school students in the United States. So, you know, and these are all these state regulations around the, the, the adoption of content, how that content is purchased by their school districts, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, is, is a patchwork uh, among the states. And to move, and of course you have teachers, you have administrators worked within the system for many, many years. And to, to move that system and to change it, probably took an event like COVID to really push these, these new concepts to the forefront and, 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 and the challenges that went along with them. So I think that that, again, when you talk, Chris, about what, is the, what does this tell us about the future, it tells us that many more school systems have been forced to confront these changes that have been coming uh, and address them, uh, whereas in the past they might have been more resistant to, to creating that type of flexibility that they need, again, to meet the students where they are not where you want them to be. Next slide. 
And lastly, um, you know, CCC, uh, just like this forum here, wants to do outreach and education. We want to bring the stakeholders together. Um, so, uh, and we also provide copyright education because as people want to make these shifts and make these changes, they are faced with copyright issues or copyright uncertainty, which is almost worse. Uh, not understanding. They want to make an open curriculum, but how do they make that curriculum open? What do they need to know about copyright to understand how to make an open curriculum? CCC wants to help you license, but if you want to make a curriculum open and available, how do you understand copyright in a way that's going to help you get to that point? Uh, we hear uh, stories that make us very sad that districts have created wonderful OER uh, uh, materials but there's so much uncertainty around whether it's copyright compliant or not, they're really not open because people are unwilling to take that risk. And so CCC is making a big initiative, again, somewhat in, relate, somewhat in response to COVID to try to bring more copyright education into K-12 so that those who do want to create these reusable, remixable open curriculum have the knowledge base to, have, to be able to reliably create them and reliably use them. And of course, we do provide news and analysis. I just got an email just before this uh, meeting that, that we posted a new uh, uh, piece to our, to our blog, Velocity of Content, that is, speaks to some of the challenges that are in K-12 education. Well, thank you for that uh, presentation, Andrew Campana with Copyright Clearance Center. And you know, I was listening to you and, and heard you talk about copyright uncertainty and I had to smile because I know it only too well and I've worked at Copyright Clearance Center for a number of years as, as I am fond of telling people when it comes to copyright, if you're confused, you're beginning to understand the problem. Yes. And in fact, we had a question before the program began when uh, we, we asked registrators or people who were registering to, to let us know what's on their mind. And, um, someone did ask about copyright best practices. This was an interesting twist on it. It wasn't so much for uh, the classroom, but for the curriculum that they were helping to develop for educators around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I guess the point there is um, that, that, that copyright is, is an issue that has, is multi-layered when it comes to education. It's not just the education in public classrooms, K-12, but it's about the education of the educators as well. Absolutely. I mean, they're, they're definitely, you know, one of, the, one of the things that comes up is what audience you're addressing, uh, you know, that if you want to use third party material, you just have to uh, be aware that, that copyright is going to become something that you need to be uh, mindful of. And, you know, I know that one of the things that we encourage everyone to do, especially because people are creating things rapidly, is, is to make sure that you document, document, document where you're finding materials um, so that when you do start to look at, you know, whether those, those materials and your use of them will comply with copyright or if you're going to require some form of permission, you know where that material came from and can track it, you know, uh, track it through your process. Uh, I think too many people end up at the end. Uh, and again, this goes back to stories about these OERs that I've heard where they probably are quite, you know, they may very well be open and available and shareable, but because they didn't keep good documentation, they don't know where that content came from. They actually can't, they don't have the confidence to say, yes, this is actually uh, an open resource that can be shared. All right, well, Andrew Campano with Copyright Clear Center, thank you for that. And now it's our chance to bring our panelists back together and to bring you, the audience, uh, into the program and ask you to uh, ask any questions of the panelists, to make any comments you'd like to make, use the chat function on your screen there and let us know what you're thinking about and how you react to what you've heard just now. And, um, you know, there was one question immediately for, for Karthik Krishnan, who is at Britannica Group, CEO there. Karthik, you were talking about the need for publishers to um, reach into as many channels as possible and use as many different technologies as possible. It's print and digital and, and, and. And someone in the audience was asking about your reference to, to knowledge graphs. And this is something that is coming up up a good deal more uh, in the discussion around digital um, publishing and, and, and presentation of information. Tell us briefly about knowledge graphs. As I understand it, they're, they're kind of a visualization of data. It also be a visualization, but it also is a way for you to navigate. Uh, for example, uh, if let's do a search on the word feminism. 
So when you do a search on Google, you're going to get a lot of blue links, right? So again, you got to click on multiple links to really understand that topic in entirety. But if you have a knowledge graph, in addition to talking about feminism, you can also talk about, hey, who are the key people associated with feminism? I mean, people might not have heard about people like Betty uh, Frieden, for example, or Myra Bradwell. And then you can also have related topics that's tied to it, right? Whether it's ecofeminism, the standpoint theory, the personal is political. I mean, these are different theories that are tied to the concept of feminism. So today there's a con uh, something called intellectual laziness. So we all do a search on the internet and we have a device like this and we expect the a search engine to give us the best result uh, probably in the top one or two because we don't even go to the second page to look for information. So in this kind of a world, when you walk away with small piece of information without really understanding a concept in entirety, then it actually creates fractionalism across the world. So from our perspective, a knowledge graph is a great way for you to navigate, right? If there is a certain topic, who are the key people I need to follow or study to really understand that? What are the different theories? Uh, for example, even with climate change, when people understand global warming, but most people have not heard of the word global cooling, even though it's equally prevalent. And uh, there is theory of Milankovitch uh, effect, theory of astronomical cycles. These are things that affect the global climate change. So it's being able to present all this in a bigger context. So even if you don't have time today, you have the opportunity to come back and revisit some of these topics. And in fact, Britannica has a solution called Britannica Insights. It is a free Chrome browser extension. And when we have something relevant to offer, the Britannica knowledge panel will appear above the Google search panel and provides you this knowledge graph for you to explore some of these topics. All right, well, well Karthik, Christian, thank you for that. Uh, we are learning that there's a lot of technology we still need to learn about. And um, we do have a question from, from Zainab uh, on our chat, which is about not so much that, well, Andrew Campana said it best, print is a technology too, and there are limitations to it. And one of the limitations to print is the distribution of it, particularly at a time when um, it may be a lockdown or otherwise restrictions on movement. And I think Beth referred to some of the challenges there for many in, in, in classrooms around the country. And, and Zainab is asking about um, the challenge of um, the delivery network here. And, and, and perhaps Paul Randall, you can talk about that in the case of the Turn to Learn initiative. As I understood, um, books were delivered to school buildings and then it was kind of curbside delivery, as we call it here in the United States, when someone orders meal online, they don't go in the restaurant, but they get it right outside the door. Is that really how it worked? It, it was in that instance. Um, I guess there's a, there's a bigger question here in terms of, you know, how, how you want that infrastructure to work. The, with, with the Piazza Cafe initiative, so it was as you described, and, and in reality, the materials were printed through um, an individual, um, you know, production site. Um, so, so there were there was a fairly um, kind of linear process there, if you like. Now, you know, with, with Piazza, actually, what you could potentially have is distributed. You know, at its ultimate goal, it's about distributed print. So, I think I mentioned earlier, we've got you know a number of um, customers spread globally. So, we, we've got. Um, printing technology in 18 different countries so you know if, if and as and when piazza cafe scales you know that content could be distributed for production amongst 18 different countries and a number of different print production partners within those countries um, and then the delivery mechanisms are essentially driven by um, you know the logistics of that country and the and the and the carrier service partners that any given um, print service provider would work with. Um, so it's you know it, it has flexibility, scalability to work in a route that is needed. All right, well, Paul Randall, thanks for that explanation. And you know, uh, it seems to me that when when you consider COVID nineteen and what is what, what it has brought to the world, it's thrust us all together, everyone on the planet in a way that probably had never happened in history before. And, and so the need to think in innovative ways really means about creating communities. And, and the communities we're talking about here today are, are, are knowledge communities. And I think Beth Miller, um, you were referring to this, that there was a greater need uh, than ever before to, to really work in collaboration, to, to partner with um, 
uh, publishers to partner with other curriculum providers to work with the school systems. Tell us a little bit more from your perspective at EL Education about that need to partner at this particular moment. Just in a very on the ground level, partnering with uh, the innovation that sort of had to happen in an emergency way with schools and districts for the distribution problem we were just talking about. Uh, schools are also major food providers, so they had to provide meals or wanted to continue to provide meals to many students. So they were distributing meals, many of them then distributed uh, packets and books and so on at those meal distribution sites. They were they were distributing Chromebooks, you know, whatever they're distributing became a challenge, but people figured it out there. They, it's been a very inventive time. We partner with a whole bunch of other professional development provider organizations as well to ensure that the curriculum is implemented. Obviously, uh, many other publishers because we are only a part of a student's learning universe. So I think I think times like this when we can get together and learn from each other and hear each other's stories are, are really important. And I think the kind of knowledge mapping that you're talking about, Karthik, is more and more important in this moment. So I appreciate hearing about that in particular. And, 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 and Karthik, uh, your thoughts on partnership. I mean, you, you do teach, uh, so you're, you can see this perspective, at, you know, from the perspective not only as a publisher, but as an educator. You're uh, an adjunct professor at uh, the NYU Stern School, and, and you're teaching students about disruptive forces in the media industry. What, what, what role does partnership play in helping to um, meet the disruption challenge? I think a lot of the problems that we're solving today are highly, highly complex. There's not one person or an organization that really has the skills to do it all. And the only way we can get it accomplished is by bringing the best people across the world to actually partner and make things happen. So to me, as much as this time has been challenging, I mean, here again, you know, you see examples of partnering, right, from HP to CCC to EL Learning to the work that we did with the Oakland uh, Unified School District. It's heartwarming to see a number of organizations coming together to enable young leaders. Our approaches might change, right? Uh, as technology evolves and time evolves, but our resolve remains steadfast. So to me, unless we bring all these resources to bear, uh, the goal of putting education on a path to prosperity as opposed to a path to disappointment will never be solved. Because today the path from education to employability to economic independence is broken and we need to fix it. And it cannot be done by a single person or an organization. Well, I, I know that everyone at Copyright Clearance Center agrees with that sentiment wholeheartedly, Karthik Krishnan. It is really a moment that we all need to come together and work together. And we appreciate everyone today on the panel joining us. We appreciate our audience joining us today, giving us an hour of their time uh, to learn about how publishing and educators are beating the challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've been um, speaking today with Paul Randall, Solutions Product Marketing Manager for HP Graphic Solutions Business. Paul, thank you very much indeed. Thank, and you. We'll, thank you, Paul. My apologies. Thank you so much for having us um, within the session today. I think it's been hugely insightful and uh, it's been a great discussion. So thank you for letting us be involved. Very glad you could join us. Karthik Krishnan, Global CEO of Britannica Group. Thank you as well. Thank you. Beth Miller, Chief Knowledge Officer at EL Education. We're glad you could join us, Beth. Thank you, great to be here. And my colleague at Cockroach Clearance Center, Andrew Campana, good to have you with us. Thank you, Chris, good to be here. Our program producers today are Haley Sund and Allison Anderton. We also had help from Jonathan Handel, Doreen Masiak, Craig Sender, and Joanna Murphy-Scott. I'm Christopher Keneally. Thanks for joining me for today's virtual town hall from Copyright Clearance Center.